So, okay. I think we are perfect in time. Yeah. So please let me first introduce uh, our uh, final speaker for today. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, introduce Zaid Hassan. So Zaid is a pioneer in the study and also discovery of quantum materials, and of course, in particular, of topological matter. And uh, he uses uh, sophisticated techniques, scattering, spectroscopy, optical spectroscopy, and also microscopy techniques to learn more about these materials. And this is also what he's going to talk about today. And uh, so he's giving a talk about the discovery uh, of topo uh, topological magnet magnets in two and three dimensions. So Said, we are very much happy to have you here. And uh, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our results here. So this talk is, uh, to be more specific, it will be more about, more specifically about churn magnets, churn, vial, and kagome magnets, and, um, and I'll, uh, I'll indicate some future directions that we are working on. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll give a five or seven minute introduction so that you can see my point of view, which is actually not theory. Uh, so, uh, so the story is about uh, starting with experiments, early experiments on topological insulators, how we were drawn to topological magnets in 2D and 3D. It's not related to any band structure calculation or theoretical prediction or anything. So, uh, and it turned out this approach uh, is working very well. Okay, so in last 10 years or so, we have seen topological uh, counterparts of metals, insulators, magnets, and superconductors. And, uh, uh, and this, uh, especially in 3D. So uh, I think uh, the th realization of 3D topological insulators opened up connection to real materials world which includes magnets and metals and uh, superconductors and whatnot. And much of these things, uh, it has experimentally, we have been probing these things uh, by combining spectroscopy and microscopy, RPS and STM. Uh, and my group does a little bit of theory as well. I'll, I'll mention where our theoretical contributions are in this field but primarily we are a spectroscopy microscopy group, okay? So uh, uh, I, I, I should start out thanking my students and collaborators whose work I will be presenting mostly. This includes Ilya, Suyang, Yashin, Gochin, Sonia, uh, Guang. And some of them have now uh, moved on and have their own research groups at other universities. So we are funded, officially funded to do uh, theory, RPS, uh, and STM. And uh, our theory work was, uh, has been uh, led by Go Ching Chan. And uh, uh, RPS is a collective, RPS and STM are collective efforts of my students. I have listed them all here. And our samples are uh, some of the Materials I'll talk about there from Ramon Shankar, Feng Teng Chou, uh, Chang Long Zhang, Shuang Zia, Nitin Samart, Claudia Felser, and a number of other groups around the world. We have uh, labs in Princeton and we also use facilities around the world. Okay. So, what we have seen, what is the connection that uh, considering a time reversal? invariant version of the quantum Hall physics, quantum Hall uh, state gives you two copies of the edge state, counter propagating uh, edge state. Uh, uh, I mean, each copy is chiral in some way. So that, that brings in Dirac Fermion into the picture, right? So when you can add time reversal copy of the integer quantum Hall state that gives you Dirac Fermion, Dirac, Dirac equation becomes relevant and all that Dirac file, all these things you keep hearing, it's because of, uh, it started with this. You just consider two copies of the quantum Hall state. Uh, and then this gives you low energy physics in the Dirac equation. And when you generalize that further, this generalization is of two type. One is tri trivial generalization. Uh, the other is non-trivial generalization. If you have a trivial generalization 
of this uh, uh, TR quantum Hall state, then you get a, uh, by stacking in the third direction, you get a, uh, you get surface states only on the side surface, but that is also, as we know theoretically, it's also described by a single invariant, just like quantum Hall or quantum spin Hall. It's not a new state, but there is a way to get a new state conceptually uh, by uh, the, in, in a uh, new state where you have uh, odd number of Dirac Fermi on all surfaces, not just the side states, but including top and bottom. So that is that must be described by four invariants. So there's a non-trivial jump here, you can see. So in other words, the 3D topological insulator is actually a new state of matter from a topological point of view. Uh, when you consider topological invariant. It's not just a simple generalization of the 2D quantum hull, quantum spin hull physics. So then that, uh, I mean, there's a number of theoretical contributor to this, uh, this, this, uh, this set of ideas. Uh, so the experimental challenge is how to couple to these, these four invariant topological states. Um, you know, uh, just do, doing some band calculation and all these things, it doesn't give you a deep insight into really how that topology connects to experimental things. So we don't do band structure. We calculate those things, but we don't do that comparison. We experimentally try to establish the topology just by experiment alone without referring to theory. But I, I thought I would give you a conceptual connection uh, without a band structure. So this, it's about uh, invariant structure. Of course, uh, it has mapping, in, I mean, you can talk about band structure having those invariants, okay? But experimentally, I don't have to refer to band structure. So this spirit is coming from the original quantum hall that, that uh, uh, or in the integer quantum hall, uh, in the original quantum Hull case, you do a transport measurement, meaning Hull conductivity. Then uh, the, the coefficient, this sigma x, y, this is your topological invariant. This is a quantum number. It's quantized by n, right? But this quantum number is a special quantum number. It's a topological quantum number. I mean, TK and N paper showed that uh, it's basically mathematical equivalent of turn number, although they did not explicitly say that. Uh, so then we are now faced with a new paradigm in some sense. But now faced with a set of uh, uh, quantum, uh, these are to, uh, topological invariants. Now, how do we measure them? So the obvious question you can ask, as we were asking in the early days in uh, uh, that, Okay, is there a transport experiment that we can do? Like uh, we, in analogy with the quantum hall, I asked Jerry Kane and he, he, he was very clear about it. And thanks for explaining to me that there is actually not, these invariants don't couple to the transport. If you, I mean, there is indirect transport consequence, but they don't come as, a, as a, in the original quantum hall paradigm scenario. So that's why transport will not give you a decisive and clear uh, thing, a uh, clear answer here. So then, the, the, so then how, do we, uh, how do we measure these invariants uh, without referring to band structure or any, any of that thing? Those are messy, ugly things. So how do we do experiments so that I can directly see the order parameters or topological invariants without uh, uh, worrying about band structure spaghetti, okay? So as I said, there's no quantized transport that is where these things are coefficients, uh, but there is some more generalized response function, which is not transport. For example, magnetic electric effect, where it's a response function, more uh, of general higher order green function, where you have one of the invariants coming as a coefficient, but then this doesn't give you these other invariants, right? So then this is, this is, this is very difficult to do. Um, and this is the invariant being one, or it's a, one way to say that this is the non-trivial phase here. So then we realize that there is a way to do 
coupled to this without referring to band structure is that we probe because these things are defined by all the, these are fun, in some sense discrete or uh, functions of all the topology, uh, all the degrees of freedom, fundamental degrees of freedom of electron. So in other words, spin, momentum, and energy, uh, uh, everything together. And then this is on the bulk and boundary. So topology is about bulk boundary correspondence. So then if we can measure the electron spin, momentum, and energy quantum number on, in the bulk and in the boundary and see how they are connected or disconnected, then we might we will be able to look at this invariance without um, without making any explicit comparison with the uh, uh, band structure. So this approach I have demonstrated. My group has demonstrated this approach, this methodology by combining spectroscopy and microscopy over the last fifteen years, and the new development. Other people doing ARPES or STM or other things. They are actually using the methodology that was established uh, before 2010. So in 2010, we established, we had this review paper, RMP. This is, this review is actually uh, mostly two thirds of, of this RMP is about this experiment. Very little theory is there. And I invited Kane to write a section of the theory. So uh, it's mostly about experiment. And then last 10 years, all that happening, the methodology people are using is some people are using is is actually based on here. Uh, okay, so I, I give one example of that. So this is like uh, 2007, eight, nine, around that time we demonstrated that uh, uh, how you could say uh, without mapping all the bands or anything, you have some sort of beta phase on the surface. So you do a spin resolve photo emission spectroscopy here in certain smart polarimetry mode. And then you, 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 uh, you can ignore certain details. I mean, I'm not going to uh, re-describe those 10 year old experiments. Uh, so these are, then you can, you can track the spin here, relative spin here and see whether this has time reversal symmetry or not like K plus is down and K minus is up. And then you can in situ also, this is an insulating topological insulator. Fermi level is cutting here, right? So all the uh, band structure is irrelevant. It, uh, it's detail is irrelevant. You have half the degrees of freedom here, right? So when you take a spin uh, in, a, in a parameter space, in this case, in momentum space, 360 degree, you get a, a bi bay phase, right? You have to take it's a spin half object electron, right? So then the topological invariant that new knot I talked about is one. This is not referring to any band structure or anything. So this is how without cal comparing or calculating, comparing with band calculation or any band theory or anything, we could see that there is something unusual on the surface that, uh, that let's say nobody tells us anything. It, it, the theory did not exist or anything. We can look at this right away. We see it's very different from Rashba. In Rashba, you will have another bond, branch, uh, another branch, and then you, you'll either get phase of zero or two pi, but you get something new here. You get half, half of that. So you have a half Dirac gas. This also you could compare with graphene. Graphene has four Dirac, uh, uh, cones, here you have uh, just one. So it's like one quarter of graphene. So there's something very unusual. And then you can also see spin momentum locking, right? Uh, K plus is down, K minus is up. So then, uh, so then this is happening on all the surfaces. You can cleave some of the other surfaces and it's independent of the surface you choose. So it's independent of the uh, uh, surface chemistry or uh, band surface band structure or uh, uh, bonding, chemical bonding, it's uh, unrelated to that. So it's, it's, it's always this odd number of fermion, half, uh, half fermion, half, um, uh, uh, um, half Dirac gas on the, on the surface. You may have some other things coexisting, but you always have at least a half Dirac gas existing here. So this uh, 12 year old story, right? So then you right away, you see the, uh, you see that if you draw this picture, you see backscattering is forbidden, direct backscattering, 
And when you do STM, you see in the quasi-particle interference pattern, you can clearly, more clearly see because STM is now measuring a higher order green function. So then you see. So in none of that, all I talked about, it was, I did not refer to any theoretical calculation, okay? So then the next thing we did is we raised the temperature up to room temperature and you saw that this spin momentum locking half Dirac gas uh, state with the new not topological invariant one survives up to room temperature 300K. So this was a very fascinating moment for, for the team that, uh, you know, uh, much of the quantum hull, quantum spin hull, all these things are at very low temperature. Can you get a room temperature topological order? So this was very exciting uh, thing for us to explore. Okay, so now this is this 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 is 2009, and within two years, this is a slide from 2011. The field exploded. There's so many things happening. This is a slide I have from all the papers are before to, around 2011. Uh, you see that right away. People are trying to do magnetic topological materials, quantum Hall effects, Landau quantization, uh, exploring quantum phase transition, doping it to a superconducting state, searching for topological superconductivity. So this, this explosion activity happened uh, a decade ago, right? So this, this, uh, uh, when these materials were demonstrated experimentally to be topological and uh, and, and so, so I'm not going to, of course, uh, the, the, now there are maybe 10,000 papers, but I'm going to focus for the rest of my talk on, as promised, on the, how these ideas led to magnetic topological matter, okay? So, uh, but a lot is happening and you can do a lot more. So one thing that motivated us, maybe also others, is that once you have this Dirac fermion, so as I said, that when you introduce time reversal symmetry, you have two copies of quantum hull, uh, the two, two, like it's like two chiral edge, they now they call, can call it helical or something. This is how Dirac fermion enters. You could also think about that uh, same thing in 3D. So then uh, once you have a single Dirac fermion that is, a lesson learned from topological insulator early days of, you can immediately ask, okay, if I have Dirac fermions, we all learn QFT quantum field theory in physics uh, physics classes. That you you just ask if you a, 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 a single Dirac fermion can be split into a pair of Weyl fermions, right? And uh, uh, in that so Dirac, and, and you could also ask whether there is another half fermion is Maharana because the, there you ask what is the, what if the wave function is real? If wave function is real, if you take its complex conjugate, you get the same thing. So uh, uh, that, that half fermion Maharana is its own anti-particle, anti, uh, anti right? Because the wave function is real. It's as simple as that. I mean, this is same with the vial. You can split vial. You can think of Dirac fermion as a pair of Weil fermion. Uh, this, so this is all, now once you have that, it's all QFT physics, there's no new physics here. Okay, so this is I think in last 10 years that has been driving the field uh, after that Dirac fermion appeared in the topological scenario. That was not there in the quantum hall. Quantum hall you always dealt with the chiral edge state. This is, uh, there was no Dirac fermion uh, until recently. So topological insulator introduced that Dirac fermion. And then much of the uh, real physics is already in the quantum field theory books. Uh, it's, it's just translating that uh, into materials and condensed matter physics. Uh, but I think the real thing is experiments. How to do these experiments this is a much more challenging task because of, I, I, I see 10,000 predictions, but most of the materials I do doesn't work in real life. So, so the re for the rest of my talk is how do you make things work in experiment uh, unrelated to theory, okay? So as I say, the, I'm, we, in my group, I'm working on all these fronts, uh, but in this talk, I'm just going to talk magnets. So what I will say that the some early effects of realizing 2D topological magnet 
and then how they led to some churn, churn magnet ideas and more recently to Kagome and Boil magnets. Okay, so, <clears throat> so what we were doing is that TIG, as I said, single Dirac fermion opened up all QFT. You don't need to know anything else. Uh, if you know quantum field theory, I came from that background. I, 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 I started as a theorist. You introduce magnetism here, either on the surface or in the bulk, then that will create a Dirac mass, right? So you will create a massive Dirac fermion. And this, all these things were already demonstrated in my, this paper that you can find it on the archive, 2008. So this massive Dirac fermion uh, as a churn insulator, spectroscopically it was there and it was reviewed in the RMP. So, but of course, this is not enough to prove that this is a churn insulator. So what did we do subsequently in the following years to prove a 2D topological magnet or uh, uh, experimentally discovering a 2D topological magnet along this line? So what did you do? Uh, so we introduced a number of experimental procedures. The techniques are not new. For example, you could do surface explore circular dichroism and see if there is a dichroic signal from the surface. And this is this should also be the, the even if your magnetic dopants are inhomogeneous. So it creates inhomogeneous magnetic field. And you could also check whether there's hysteresis in the sample and that hysteretic behavior is correlated with the uh, uh, gap you see. And also the gap has to disappear as a function of temperature when magnetism uh, is gone, right? So these are, these are checks. Uh, we're not just, as I said, we're not just relying on ARPES to tell us that we have churn insulator. But it, it turns out still our, our is, uh, spin up is a very powerful uh, probe of churn insulator. For example, here, if you don't do spin up as there is no way to tell what type of gap you have realized. Uh, as I will show examples that um, only with a true magnetic gap in a topological band structure, you get this hedgehog type spin texture. You could be fooled by a gap um, from some of their extrinsic sources of gap. Like if you have a thin film, top and bottom surface can talk, uh, talk to each other and create a gap. But this is, this will not create a, you do spin out, so you will not create a hedgehog texture. Or you uh, dope it with some non-magnetic dope and it will not create that either. And then you can also check temperature dependence that uh, as you raise temperature is the gap closing also doping dependence. Uh, the magnetic doping on topological insulator and non-magnetic doping should have different spectral properties because one breaks time reversal, other introduces disorder. Both can be interesting, but there is a unique signature. So we found that spectroscopically speaking, the most powerful signature is, is this um, uh, is this, uh, this hedgehog type spin texture. And that is distinguished from time reversal invariant spin texture like Z2 Dirac type or tunneling gap type of thing. Tunneling gap will not create this out of plane. So if you take, place your Fermi level here, you'll find a spin polarized for surface Fermi surface. So we were doing that in situ. We were doping NO2 uh, gas molecule. This is like chemical doping, chemical gating to bring the Fermi level inside the gap, magnetic gap, and see whether how the uh, uh, spin texture evolves. So, so in some way, is you, are, you are in high energy, then you have full Berry curvature, you have the full Berry phase. As you move to low energy, then now you see the Berry phase is destroyed. You have a spin polarized Fermi surface. So we could, we also trace that uh, this very phase tunability, and we can see that it, it disappears. So all these systematics together convinced us, I mean, this is not just this, including all of that, convinced us we have a way to know when we have a churn magnet or churn insulator. For example, this is a churn insulator, gap, uh, Fermi level is inside the gap. It has this uh, uh, hedgehog spin texture, okay? So now we can apply this, methodology, this idea 
you know, I, I see these days, a lot of people, they, they look at a magnetic material, they look at, they do RPS and band structure and conclude this is a magnetic topological insulator. Even 10 years ago, we were, we're not believing theorists or anything. I mean, we were trying to figure this, all these things out by experiment. So now I think this is not a good healthy trend to just, I'm not, there's nothing against theorists, they're doing their job, but experimentalists should do their own homework. It's just not, somebody said that this is theoretically predicted, then you will find, do some uh, sketchy experiment. That doesn't tell you anything really. If you take the theory out, just look at your experimental data, see if the data alone tells you anything. So we applied those ideas to uh, Kagome materials because Kagome materials are interesting from the point of view at the K point, there is a direct Formion, Dirac crossing, and there's a flat band. So this is before this two-state bilayer graphene uh, revolution. Uh, what we were doing, we were uh, trying to think how, uh, how to uh, combine Dirac Fermion, which might be a signature of topology in the presence of spin orbit and uh, flat band. So that was the idea. Uh, you could do heterostructure or hybrid structure, all sorts of thing. So this is our way of entering the strong correlation topology scenario. Uh, I still believe that this is uh, perhaps more powerful uh, conceptually, physically, and fundamentally. That's because unlike graphene, here we have spin orbit. So this, you could expect rich physics here. Although we haven't found superconductivity yet uh, uh, on on the flat band of Kagome, but we found superconductivity. Some other group found superconductivity on the Dirac band and Kagome magnet. So it's it's making progress, very interesting. And potentially it's more rich because uh, unlike carbon, uh, uh, you have here you have spin orbit. So so that's why I'm, I, I, I have been sticking to this. So now that I, I showed how to experimentally figure out whether you have a churn magnet or not, and on the way you could get fooled in many possible ways. Uh, so, so we sorted that out. Now we can apply it to other things. So now one idea is that if you have a Kagome magnet and then you, there, is a, uh, there is a magnetic uh, moment in some layer that is out of plane that it will create a churn gap uh, from in the presence of spin orbit. So then now the question is whether that is uh, topological or not. So we, we can apply the methodology we have been developing, introducing for last 10 years or so. So, so it looks like uh, they're interesting. Now we can apply that to many materials and see whether you have it, uh, uh, whether there is theoretical prediction or not, uh, we can figure out, okay? So, um, so this compound, this iron tin compound has also been studied by using transport by group at MIT. Uh, we have the paper, we were also studying that in parallel. Uh, we have a paper, both papers are in nature in the same year, but we are using STM. This is the reason because uh, in general, I have difficulty believing transport right away on topological thing, as I said. Uh, it's kind of like a black box. You look at transport data, how do you know it's topological? So what, why were we doing STM? We were trying to see, okay, so with STM, you can do a layer resolve electronic structure. So is there a difference between the non-Kagome layer and the Kagome layer? Or what is the electronic structure of the Kagome layer? What is there direct fermion? Is there flat band things? Like, uh, so we could, uh, spatially resolve that in the C direction, that electronic structure. So we found that, yeah, it is a, a Kagome system uh, indeed, uh, we but we found something more. Uh, what we found is then the Kagome plane, this instead of sixfold or threefold, because it's bilayer, uh, we found the twofold symmetry of electronic uh, uh, structure, QPI. Uh, in the absence of a field, uh, it's magnetic anyway. But then when we apply a field, what we found interesting is that that twofold axis moves with the field. So that's, that's very interesting. And then if we apply out of plane field, then finally the sixfold uh, uh, 
structure appear. So this uh, is a, in my view, is a signature of uh, some sort of electronic pneumaticity because with STM we can see the lattice is lattice is not twofold. It's um, it's Kagome. So so the uh, the with uh, so that means this is a, a signature of many body strong correlation in the system that it created a uh, electronic pneumatic state. And uh, there are other examples of pneumatic, electronic pneumatic state, but what is interesting here is that this is the, in my view, uh, as far as I know, it's the first uh, example where you put uh, a control or tune the pneumatic axis with an external field. So this is, this is, uh, this is unprecedented. This is very interesting. So this, uh, why do I say this? this is an uh, example that we are indeed bringing in a, a many body correlation or strong correlation in a uh, topological system that uh, it's not superconductivity, but it's interesting from a different point of view. Okay, so let me go back to the topological part. So as I showed that in 2012, in manganese dope bismuth uh, based topological insulators, we showed, we observed magnetism and showed churn gap, existence of churn gap. But what was the weakness of that experiment? We could not resolve the edge state, and but the edge states were not accessible to experiment. And then Landau levels are not resolved in transport by magnetically doping these materials. The, there was so much disorder that the, the mobility probably went down. And so uh, beyond observing the churn magnetism or churn insulator gap, we could not do much. The experiment did not take off. So a, a year later, it looked like the chromium dope bismuth based TIs. Uh, this was a project led by uh, Chikon Shue Group in China. They could uh, do transport on it. So transport gives some indirect signature of edge state. Uh, you cannot do edge state uh, self energy or edge state spectroscopy on, on those samples. And they're very low temperature, millikelvin or South Kelvin or Kelvin temperature type of thing. The drawback of this, this is a beautiful experiment for sure, but the drawback is that the churn gap is very small, like a millipole, so you cannot do much uh, beyond that. So then, uh, so the challenge remains uh, that, so then uh, around 2018, there was ideas of Kagome magnets and churn gap, so, but here again, the, uh, the, the, the experiments I showed, there is churn gap, uh, but edge states are not accessible to experiments. And there, is a, there was some anomalous Hall effect seen in transport by the MIT group. So then uh, this was the state of the affair there. So then at that point, it was clear, what is the field? Uh, uh, what is the goal of this field of topological magnets or magnetic topological materials uh, is one of the major goals was to identify or make a 2D churn magnet in the quantum limit where edge states are accessible, Landau levels are accessible. These things were not possible back then. And churn gap is unlike one millivolt in the Xinhua quantum anomalous Hall experiment. We want uh, a churn gap that's uh, more than uh, 25 millivolt. Uh, we want to operate at room temperature. The way I showed the 3D topological state, we demonstrated uh, that it, it's topological even at room temperature, right? So these uh, developments are not only fun, uh, interesting from a fundamental physics point of view, it's also interesting from an application point of view. You want to have a, uh, your topological physics operating at room temperature. Uh, and in the interacting limit, there might also be uh, some many body physics. Now we, I don't have time, but I, uh, uh, we have a PRL where we showed that this, uh, these new compounds are showing this condolatis physics. No superconductivity yet, but uh, that doesn't mean there's no many body physics in this topological materials, okay? So, uh, so with that uh, background, we were searching further uh, and then that, led us to discover this 166 class. So, so this was guided by our past experience on topological magnet for over 10 years. And then this, uh, this uh, utilizing our uh, materials uh, knowledge, 
we could identify a large gap topologic uh, 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 turn insulator magnet. And this is in the 166 class. And this 166 class uh, uh, can satisfy the, all these goals, at least spectroscopically. That's what we do spectroscopically or microscopically. Okay, so this, is re this was reported in Nature last year. So what we uh, found that this system, uh, if you have terbium, then you have out of plane uh, moment in the uh, applied on the Kagome plane. So that will maximize your turn gap, topological magnetic gap. And then it, with other rare art, you have some topological gap, but not, but is, there is also complex magnetism. So now, uh, Another amazing thing about this compound grown by our collaborators in China uh, is that this is, uh, this is very clean system. This is STM scan, we can see that within the field of view, there's not a single defect. Uh, defects are out of the view, but the patch is large enough that we can do a lot of STM work. So Kagome magnets are not new. Many people have been studying, as I said, that uh, uh, if we put under STM to look how good is the sample quality, you can see this other Kagome magnet like MN3SN, uh, this FESN and this cobaltine sulfur, Claudia Felser group has uh, been growing those things. So you can see that these samples are not that good compared to this one, one six is compared, it's very clean. We can check under uh, subatomic resolution uh, uh, STM experiments. So then if we are to explore the details of like the detail people pro quantum hull physics, that community is 40, 50 years old, we, uh, we need very clean samples like that so that we can take the field of magnetic topological materials or churn magnets or top magnetic topological thing to its next frontier, give it a tenure in the long run. So we need clean materials like this, okay? So then when we apply a field, then we see right away, we see there's a very clear DOS modulation. This is without DIDV, this is without uh, DOS modulation. And then we can clearly see uh, DOS modulation. And then when we look at, uh, as I said, I'm doing STM now because you can uh, uh, check whether the physics is coming from your Kagome plane because there are other irrelevant planes or irrelevant bands or other things. So now we go to non Kagome plane, then you apply the same field in same direction, there's no DOS modulation. So in other words, this DOS modulation is related to the application of a full field. So that means clearly we're seeing Landau quantization here. So uh, to check that how, how sure are we? So to check that we can do, we can do a, do a detailed track that uh, how this uh, Landau bands or Landau uh, uh, levels are dispersing in energy, right, or with the field. So we can clearly see that this is nonlinear and higher Landau levels being nonlinear is a signal of signature of Dirac physics. We have seen that in graphene, there's the early paper on graphene. And um, of course, linear uh, uh, linearity would imply parabolic band, but we can do more. We can fit these things. And when we fit, it looks like the best fit is with a massive Dirac fermion. But you could say, oh, you, you would also see that in graphene, but then how do you know it's topological? So this is, I'm coming to that. So this is what I was building up all that experimental machinery, how to say that without uh, referring to theory or band structure or anything. So experiment alone can prove that. So we just, uh, now we see that there's a fit, but then there's uh, that, all that tells us is it's a massive Dirac fermion. That's true, but not necessarily a uh, churn gap fermion. So then, uh, but still let's see what, how far can we go? So we find that the Dirac uh, point is 130 millivolt away uh, from the Fermi level. And the gap is more than 30 millivolt, 34 millivolt and we can extract from the velocity. And uh, just for fun, as I said, I'm funded to do theory. So I asked my theory postdocs to calculate and see if things make sense, just, just, just for the fun of it, but not to guide it. Okay, so then now if it is 
a massive Dirac fermion like graphene type of thing, but not topological, then there would not be a chiral edge state. But if it is a, uh, so there are two signatures possible. One is this hedgehog spin texture or uh, find a chiral edge state. Uh, find a chiral edge state is a more direct signature. Uh, hedgehog spin texture, we're doing that because edge state or, or tracking edge state was not easy. Uh, samples had too much disorder and other problems. So then uh, if we can right away find the chiral edge state, we, we, are, we know that that massive Dirac fermion is actually topological map, topological magnetic map. So indeed, so when we uh, explore the step edge and scan through the energy, and we see that only at the around 130 millivolt um, uh, bias, we can see that there is a, there is conducting edge channel. So in other words, now this these edges are inside the gap because this is uh, 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 Fermi level is 130 millivolt away. This came this number we found by fitting it to a massive Dirac Fermi on the Landau levels. And then we find the edge state there. And then with STM, as I showed, as we did in topological insulator materials, that this edge state is uh, backscattering free. So this is chiral edge state. And to make sure that it, we're not fooled by something else, we can also do a side cleave and see whether uh, side cleave is thin. Uh, side cleave is thin. So this is uh, really that. And, and this is also a remarkable coincidence. It's only at 130 millivolt, it lights up, which we get by fitting the uh, nonlinear Landau levels. So that means there is edge state. Now, we can also do transport uh, in collaboration. This is, uh, now we are looking at the anomalous hull scaling of the system. And if we try to fit that, we find that uh, the best fit is comes from when Fermi level is 130 millivolt and gap is 34 millivolt. Now go back uh, by uh, Landau level quantization fitting, we found 34 millivolt. This is consistent with transport. So STM and transport is remarkably uh, uh, consistent. So now what is it that uh, new? What I, I would argue that now that we have so much detailed microscopic handle on this material, we can do further materials engineering to a desired state. That it was not possible with the quantum anomalous hull sample introduced by the Chinese group. Uh, uh, so you, we don't know the microscopics because we cannot do uh, spectroscopy on those systems, uh, the details, we cannot find those things. So what is the advantage? Why, the, what is the gain? The gain here is that now we know how to tune these materials further to take it to the quantum limit to uh, optimize various things. So a possible future experiment to be we're planning is that the chiral edge state we see, is it lutinia liquid? How much interaction is there? So we can do quantum hall like detail, uh, second generation or third generation experiments on these things. Now we can see so far in in discovering this material or this uh, demonstrating this uh, charm magnet physics, I did not refer to any band structure calculation or anything, right? So this is how experiment progresses. And this is how we have been working that take the th uh, theoretical conceptual scenario and then, 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 then uh, uh, do experiments to figure out, let experiments prove everything. If, if it doesn't, then it's not that interesting Anyway, okay. So similarly, uh, now I go back 10 years again, uh, we have a theory paper. As I said, I'm funded for theory as well, uh, where we showed that, as I said, it's a QFT physics quantum field theory. If you have a Dirac fermion, you can, if you break symmetry, you will split it into a pair of vile fermions. So in these papers, we, um, this is Su Yang Zhu's science paper 2011, we said that, okay, we have a 3D Dirac fermion in this compound. This is uh, uh, again from topological insulator, this bismuth selenide complicated version of that. So we said that if you can break symmetry, you'll find vile fermion. So I asked my student Ray to magnetize the Dirac critical point here. And these other students to magnetize these other compounds we have uh, studied. 
And I asked Suyang and Ilya to search in the database to find inversion broken analogs of this thing that is that was Suyang's thesis. He's now a faculty at Harvard. Uh, his, his, uh, he, uh, he's the one with Ilya, they were, they, they were working along these lines. This goes back 2010 and 12. So then we wrote this theory paper where we gave a materials algorithm to find in this much simpler than symmetry or group analysis or anything. It, uh, it works with experimental intuition. So we said, okay, if we, if, since we have been finding topological insulators for so many years, so then let's see if we start with the topological insulator, how to create a Wilson elemental out of that. Uh, you will find, uh, ICSD analog of all these things, materials database. So you start with the topological insulator. This is your Dirac fermion circle, Fermi surface. If you close the gap, uh, let's say you close at these two points, then you have a Dirac semi-metal with Fermi arc. And then if you break symmetry, then this Dirac point must uh, split into vial. And then that necessarily breaks your Fermi surface to Fermi arc. That, that's all. If you already know how to find to discover topological insulators, you can find this thing. So this is how we entered this task scenario. This, I, when this paper was submitted November 2014, all other theory paper predicting this came two months or later. So then in experiments, we actually did not use our theory uh, at all. We used something else. Uh, that that I'm going to tell you, because as I told you, that I want to do experiments without comparing with bench structure or any, any spaghetti, any of that stuff, because that's kind of ugly to me. So now, how do we determine vial topology? You can do surface Fermi surface or bulk Fermi surface with our technique, ARPES. And then we see these features on the surface. So we want to see a loop cut, because if whether there is anything strange about the loop cut, ARPES people usually don't do loop cut, they just do a straight cut. So if we do a loop cut, then we, um, uh, we see something very unusual that we see chiral edge modes propagating in momentum space. So two of them and their uh, counterpart is not there or anywhere. So, so that's very unusual because in our past experiments, we have never seen that, that type of uh, uh, thing. So this was uh, in two papers two science papers by the same first author, 2014 and 15. So this chiral edge mode is very, very strange. So then now if you superpose the low energy RPS and the high energy RPS, and energy RPS probes the bulk, we find these uh, vial points, this point Fermi surfaces, if you like, hypothetical. But then when you do low energy, which picks preferentially on the surface, then you see this, these arc-like things, they terminate on these points. So, so this, then this is the topological bulk boundary correspondence. So this surface and bulk. So we put, when we put bulk and surface together, so it looks like the, the, where the Fermi arc terminates, that's where the vial node is. Now the vial is split because uh, uh, they were, it was together when it was a Dirac Dirac 3D Dirac fermion, but then there is a splitting and the same splitting is in the arc. So now these two are coinciding in momentum space. So then this is, this is, this is the vial semi-metal. This is your vial fermion and broken Fermi surface that I showed here and which originated from our 2011 paper idea in a, in a series of papers. Okay, so, but experimentally, we did not use anybody's band calculation or anything. We just uh, showed that there's something unusual uh, by experiment alone, okay? So how do you find these arcs? We already showed that there's a double vial existence. You can see our earlier paper year before 2014, also in science paper by the same first author. So it gets mixed. So there we showed how to do vial, uh, uh, how to find how, arcs connected double vial state. We could not resolve it because the splitting is small. And so this methodology was used by all other ARPES people later on. So 
using our 2014 paper, we published the 15 paper. This is where we showed, as I showed, the bulk boundary correspondence uh, without referring to any band calculation, how file fermion and Fermi arcs are connected. And on the same issue, there was also a paper from MIT, their uh, people, their photonic people, but that, that's not a vile fermion. A photonic crystal, there is, this is bosonic degree of freedom. You, if you can call it vile boson if you like, but this is not, and they did not show any arc. There's paper from uh, IOP China in PRX. They talked about arc, but there's no topological proof. There's no file fermion there. And then after that, a lot of people uh, uh, caught up on this. So then what did we do with that? Then we, 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 we uh, but as I said, the original goal was to realize a magnetic, this churn gap 3D topological, how do you get a file magnet? Uh, things like that. So we did not deviate from our original goal. So we utilized, okay, if we have, uh, we figure out how to get this vile uh, system, then we utilize this, two, I think this 2011 paper, this Burkov hook balance, this th theorist. So they were proposing this, if you have particle hole symmetry, you'll get a flat band. So remember I told you Kagome magnets, all these things, we're looking for flat bang for a possibility of strong correlation and topology connecting. This is why I found this paper interesting. But in real materials, you don't have particle hole symmetry unless you have superconductivity, then the topology is destroyed, right? So, but in general, you'll get some curvature on the band. Uh, but the idea is that this nodal line could be uh, there's a winding, non-trivial winding number there. So, uh, so we utilized this idea. We said that, okay, what if on the nodal line, this nodal line of work of hook balance, uh, what if uh, each point is a vile point? Can we find a system? So then this, we argued in a PRL paper, theory paper, that there is a way to construct a topological magnet in 3D using this, by combining these ideas that you could play with these nodal lines uh, rings and uh, you could nest them or interlink them. Uh, and then we also gave the, what type of invariance you'd expect. So then, uh, so this led to our theoretical prediction paper of a 3D topological magnet. And uh, these ideas could be realized in this cobalt manganese compound. Uh, there's a very complicated band structure there, but then again, uh, when you go to band structure, you, it gets ugly. So how do we do a neat experiment that bypasses this ugliness of band structure that we are stuck in our own theory paper? So this is the rest of the story is like that. Okay, so we, we are confronted with reality. Okay, so this material is so complicated, so many bands, we just have to uh, track them all. Just let's just do a boring job. Let's do that. Let's see what happens. So we decided much of the work is done by Ilya Bilopolsky. Uh, uh, actually, he got the APS award for Conus Matter thesis uh, this year for this work. It, it's a very detailed work. So we tracked all the bands uh, in systematic way and see whether there are vile nodal lines. So one thing he, uh, he was doing, for example, Let's say this is energy, this is uh, kx, ky. So then if there is a nodal line crossing, then the band should have this type of behavior in this cuts, energy cuts, different energy cuts that if you are at higher energy, it will look like this uh, bracket type of thing. And then the, the other side of the bracket and then in between you'll get a crossing. So, uh, so you have to track which energy is, is doing that. So you can see focus on this part. It's doing this as you raise, uh, go to higher binding energy, then it became a dot, that thing, and then it reverses direction. So, so that means there is a, there's a crossing here, some sort of band crossing here. So he was tracking all these things and then checking whether these points are vile points and then whether they create a loop, nodal loop. So this is a lot of work, a uh, lot of band tracing uh, by doing that, he figured that he, indeed this, there is a, 
a continuous nodal loop and then each point is a file point and then the idea we the experimental methodology we apply is the one we were doing before to identify file physics uh, but then uh, as you re remember that we just did not believe that this crossing is topological uh, you know there's all sorts of band crossing you'll see in arpas uh, without referring to any theory how do you know again uh, that there is something topological. Go back to bulk boundary and see whether those crossings are interlinked with surface states. Okay, so indeed in RPS, without referring to any theory, you can do uh, photon energy dependence to track. Photon energy tells you in one mode of operation, it will tell you whether the uh, feature you see or the bands you see if they're their, whether their electron wave packet has KZ dispersion or not. So if there is no KZ dispersion, as you change photon energy, not, the peak will not change. So this way, he could, Ilya could identify that there's non-dispersive features that connect these vial nodes in the loop. So then this is uh, what Burkov balance called drum head uh, in their paper. Uh, so this, so that means, these green dots, they have no KZ dispersion. They're electrons occupying those states. They're, they're, uh, they're two dimensional. And then the yellow ones are three dimensional. So, so now again, as I said that uh, there's so a lot of band tracing uh, spaghetti stuff that I don't like. So I want to find a neat way to figure out independent of uh, experiment, uh, the band structure experiment. That there is, Zahid, there is sorry for sorry, sorry for interrupting. You had fifty-five okay. minutes just to let you know. Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, this is, I'll, then I'll uh, cut it here. Uh, right, no, but slide. Uh, yeah. Fine. Oh, I have five minutes. Five, okay. five is fine. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Sure. Okay, so then what we did, okay, so RPES with uh, all these uh, RPES results, we took then, we fit that into DFT and um, built a model, DFT, that gives a best fit to RPES. Now that we have a model, we can calculate the Betty curvature field or quantum geometry of the system. Uh, so then if we uh, calculate the quantum geometry of the system, then we can calculate transport if that is reliable. So this is what we're doing. We're calculating anomalous Hall conductivity as a function of the chemical potential. And from our past, we know where the chemical potential is in this real sample, in this real material. So we place that here, this is the chemical potential in this compound. So then we, from that, we read off that the anomalous hull conductivity should be around 900 standard units here, if the chemical, it's not at the, near the uh, uh, vial node singularity or something where it will lead to near divergence. That's not the case, it's here. So then if we do that, then, then we can compare with transport. This was uh, measured by Kaustoff Manna in Claudia Pilser's group. And then when Kaustoff sent us these results, uh, he is finding, this is experimental transport results, he's finding 870 uh, um, in standard units. And this is very much uh, consistent with the RPS based prediction. So, why is that important? Why did I say that whether there is very curvature field, non-trivial quantum geometry here or not, how, why is that I, this is uh, not because I don't believe purpose, but you could, uh, you could easily miss some important band because RPS is a very complicated technique. So I wanted to make sure, so that's number one reason that we did not miss any band. If we miss any band, then this will be, this will not come out right. The Berry curvature quantum geometry calculation will be totally off. And then the second reason is that, you know, you can do our uh, transport and all these things. It doesn't tell you any of the topological features that was going on. So this is the second reason. 
that you can do a lot of transport on 3D complex materials with multiband. I'm not saying ideal simple quantum hull samples type of thing. I'm talking when I, uh, um, I'm being critical of transport, I, I mean 3D materials with multiband structure that uh, where identifying topologies in transport is very much difficult. Uh, but then the fact that now ARPAS and transport are in agreement is a remarkable thing. Previously, I showed STM and transport are in agreement, but I, 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 in my view, I just cannot take transport and look at transport data alone without theory or anything and tell something that is topological. So that's, that's the point I'm making here. So then I'm, I'm, I'm reaching my conclusion that uh, in topological magnet, we demonstrated how to identify a uh, churn gap, topological gap in a magnetic material in 2D and also in 3D. Uh, and then we, we showed uh, these materials are quite rich that there is pneumatic uh, physics in uh, cargo topological magnets. There is vial magnet that has interesting quantum geometry, quantum uh, uh, very curvature field and quantum geometry. And, and then I showed STM and transport are in remarkable agreement in the new churn magnets, the high temperature, what I call high temperature churn insulator magnets. And then uh, in the, and also in the vial magnets, I showed that there's remarkable agreement between ARPES topology and transport signature, although it's not obvious <laughs> by looking at transport, it's topological. Uh, but it's it's useful. So I, I would say that synergy, the synergy is important. And my group, I'm now also funded for doing transport. So my group in the next few years will be combining spectroscopy and transport, just as I, I showed a few example, uh, to explore this wonderful world of topological magnets that we started out uh, uh, many years ago. So of course, I did, I kind of gave a, uh, overview of the field from my point of view in my lab, uh, but I did not go over all the technical details, neither in experiment nor in theory. So students or young researchers, they are welcome to find uh, technical details related to our experiments in our review papers where we give more details. So, uh, uh, so uh, the starting point would be this RMP, which gave us a lot of thing, how to use ARPES or STM to explore topological physics and what was new experimentally or methodologically it's described there. And then more recently, vial and magnets and other things. I did not list, uh, we have two recent papers, both one in nature review materials and one in nature review physics. Uh, I forgot to list them. They, they, those two nature review papers give you the most recent development in addition to this. Thank you. So many thanks, uh, uh, Zahid, for this uh, exciting overview. So we have now a couple of questions. Uh, Zahid, if you like, you can uh, read them yourself and then answer. So can you please click on a question and answer? So Q&A, it must be uh, on your screen. Yeah, yeah, I can see it. And uh, then, uh, so if, if you don't mind, please, please read them and then uh, please answer. Okay, so the first question I have, why anomalous Hall effect is so special as a transport signature for a topological semi-metal? So uh, when I answer, do I have to uh, click answer live or? Uh, yeah. Or, or, uh, the, uh, can, can the question or listen, to, uh, hear me or? I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just mention that. Okay. So uh, anomalous Hall effect is related to Betty curvature. And uh, since the Betty curvature field is the source of topology, so it's, it's, uh, it's clearly connected. An anomalous Hall effect is a, um, uh, the intrinsic part of the anomalous Hall effect is related to uh, 
that, that's how it's related to topology, at least in the violet topological uh, semi metal case. Yeah. So the second question is um, how is the uh, how is the Hamiltonian of a churn magnet? Is there any basic theory paper on it? Well, I mean, I'm not. Uh, I used um, uh, okay. I did not. It's true. I did not rigorously define churn magnet, uh, but I conceptually. I did not rigorously mathematically define. I conceptually described it in a way that, uh, let's say, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about two conceptual definitions. One is like, you take a topological insulator and you magnetize it, say out of plane magnetism, then uh, it breaks time reversal symmetry, right? The Z2 topology is now lost. The kane meli type topology is now lost. Uh, now then uh, you localize one of the helical edge modes. The, the, the other remains, since each mode is like chiral, so then it becomes a single edge mode uh, that is uh, in a magnet that's propagating inside the, on the boundary inside in momentum energy space, it's inside the gap. So then what is the, a topological object must be give, described by a topological invariant. So that, uh, that invariant is, now we have a single edge mode. One is localized out of that helical edge pair. Now that invariant is actually the same invariant as TKNN invariant. It's like the quantum Hall invariant, integer quantum Hall invariant. So a topological magnet in 2D in this sense, it's really not a new topological object in my view. In my view, uh, similarly, quantum anomalous Hall effect people talk about a lot, quantum anomalous Hall effect in my view is not a new phase of, new topological phase of matter because I argue that it's, it's topological invariant, the same good old two TKNN invariant that describe von Klitzing's uh, integer quantum Hall state. So, so 2D topological magnet is not new. It's, it's topologically isomorphic to the original integer quantum Hall. But of course, the, why there is so much excitement then? That's because now you can get rid of an external magnetic field. So there is a lot of experimental play if you uh, can may potentially integrate into a device that may work for you. So, uh, so yeah, it's fundamentally not new, TKNN, uh, but it's experimentally exciting. And then I'll come to the second part of my talk where I talked about 3D topological magnet. That's new. There's, uh, there's no 3D quantum Hall uh, uh, state that's described by those very curvature field and uh, the, that, that sort of thing. So, so, uh, so the state we see in um, uh, gallium, uh, this manganese uh, uh, compound that uh, that compound is the new, this is the first in my view, as far as I can tell, this is the first experimental demonstration of a 3D topological magnetic system that is unprecedented. There's nothing before that, but the churn magnet is not new. It's just TKN and old, old stuff. Okay, so now let me move to the second uh, next question. Uh, is Landau level quantization confirms the, uh, so this is a very good question. Uh, is Landau level quantization confirms the topological nature? Of, no, I, I, I was explicit about it, uh, if you remember. Like, uh, what I said is that the Landau level quantization, if you have high, higher order nonlinear Landau levels, it tells you that you're dealing with massive Dirac fermions. Massive Dirac fermions doesn't, are not necessarily topological in a strict sense. Uh, so this is why I added additional experimental proof. Is there a chiral edge state that's backscattering free? So, but of course, a churn magnet derived out of a, a topolo uh, out of a from topological materials, if it is not, uh, if it doesn't have massive Dirac fermion, then you are out of luck. Uh, but massive Dirac fermion alone doesn't prove. Uh, topology. Uh, the topology proof comes from bulk boundary correspondence. That's why I showed that 
inside that massive the mass of the mass gap of the Dirac fermion in that system, there is a um, um, there is a um, um, chiral edge state and single chiral state, so that makes it look like that. So you have to combine. So the next question is: Is the one six six material? What is the surface termination? How deep you, uh, you your DIDV signal correspond to? So uh, you can have different surface termination, including uh, a side cleave. Uh, but the surface termination is generally uh, uh, generally on the Kagome plane, and the DIDV signal in STM. It doesn't go deeper. It's, it probes the kind of like the mostly the first conducting layer. So this is why we want to uh, pick a, a cleaved surface that is Kagame, because that's where the electronically active, interesting, relevant bands are. Uh, so so it works for STM, but it may not be that easy for transport. You have to. Uh, uh, you have to figure out how to isolate other things. I don't, I don't do, I'm not an expert in transport. I don't know how to make that work, but in STM, um, uh, it, it works. Uh, the next question is, uh, the second part of the question is from how many layers uh, the IDV signal, it's the first conducting layer. Uh, Okay, so the question after that is in magnetic volume metals, how is chirality defined relative direction of magnetization and current or relative direction of uh, this the, uh, uh, and or relative direction of applied magnetic field and current? Yeah, it, it, this did depends on the details of the band structure and the orbitals that are involved and the detail of magnetism. I don't think, as far as I understand, there is no obvious universal general um, uh, statement that describes it. Um, not, at least not that I know of. Uh, yeah, it depends on the micro, various details of the system. So the next, next, uh, next question is, is it possible for strong orbit uh, spin orbit coupling present in a material to manipulate the phone transport in any temperature range? Uh, manipulate the phonon transport, I mean the lattice vibration uh, in any temperature range. If there is, and then uh, you're saying, okay, so let me try to understand the question better. Is it possible for strong spin coupling present in a material to manipulate the phonon transport in any temperature range? Uh, spin orbit coupling, of course, that's an electronic thing, and phonon is a lattice thing. I think uh, whether uh, if there is strong electron lattice coupling, or uh, uh, then it's not related to spin orbit coupling. I mean, of course, spin orbit is an electronic term. Uh, with if so, my I, I don't I don't think I fully understand this question. But uh, if you mean by spin orbit coupling, which is the electronic degree of freedom, uh, so my answer is kind of trivial. Maybe I did not understand the question. That if there is a ele strong electron phonon coupling, of course, then if you tune spin orbit that's tuning the electronic part, then there will be some phonon or lattice effect in transport. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure, yeah. Okay, thank okay, you very one, much. One more, one more question. If one uses a substrate such as the Weissen metal sample gets strained, then will the pseudo electromagnetic field be generated inside the sample? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you strain a vial semi-metal, then um, it's, if that strain field works in a way that the vial splitting is larger, that means you are tuning very curvature. Um, and then in addition to that, there may be other, like in graphene, the strain field in graphene can create a large pseudo magnetic field. 
uh, and like spontaneous London local quantization things like that. Yeah, I mean you'll you'll see, but I I I am not sure how to decouple those things in experiment. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Sahid, for extensively answering many questions. So there is an additional discussion section now, uh, and uh, the links are just being provided in the chat. So, um, so Sahid, there, uh, so you're probably informed, yeah? So there's a, another discussion section now, and uh, this starts right now. Okay. So for the moment, thanks a lot again, yeah, for for your your really nice overview and for all your time answering questions. Yeah, thank you all for organizing this meeting. Thank you.